In the 19th and early 20th century, Christmas in Catoctin Furness included bell schnickling. In the mid-1980s, Clement Gardner, longtime village resident and owner of Auburn, wrote the story you are about to hear. Through the eyes of an eight-year-old, his memories transport us back to a Christmas during the Great Depression. Clem's son, Christopher, lovingly reads the story. Bell snickling, the memory lingers. December 20th, 1928, or was it December 21st, 1930? The former eight-year-old boy didn't take notes, but he remembers the gray brooding sky that smelled of snow, the furious activities within the house by all the ladies, the cleaning, the dusting, the cooking, the baking, the wrapping and decorating, and all the hustle and bustle that spelled the approach of Christmas. And that was the background for a certain day when Jim, the gardener, helper friend, appeared at the back door with several stout locust posts. What the heck are you doing, Jim? asked the eight-year-old boy. Got to prop up the whole floor. Last time the bell snicklers were here, they darn near collapsed it. Miss Louise said to prop it up good and strong. When they get to dancing, everything in the house shakes. And with that, Jim was off down the cellar steps with his burden of stout posts, which were in due course erected in strategic positions to reinforce the 20-foot span of the floor joists under the central hall against the arrival of the bell snickers. The days before Christmas seemed to drag on forever back in 1928, or was it 1931? But slowly and surely, December 25th arrived. For the eight-year-old boy, that day started hours before dawn when excitement brought him fully awake out of a sound sleep, hoping that Santa had filled his stocking, but fearing, in spite of himself, that the jolly gentleman had not appeared. How could he? Hadn't the boy been awake all night? He would certainly have heard any noise Santa made while filling the stocking so carefully tied to the head of the bed. So it was each Christmas morning, a new and exciting experience to reach out a hand ever so slowly until the touch of fingers on the distended and mysteriously crunchy stocking confirmed Santa's magic visit. What was the slender, hard object halfway down the stocking? Ah, the round orb in the toe must surely be an orange. But this soft, yielding thing that rustled vaguely when pinched? A handkerchief? A necktie? And so it was, as one's fingers ran up and down the entire length of the now filled to bursting stocking, which only hours before had been a limp, listless length of wool. But there were strict rules about waking the grown-ups up before a reasonable hour, and the boy must be content to speculate in the dark about the stocking's contents. Christmas Day was a joy for all, from the young ones who finally were able to empty their stockings and exclaim delightedly over each treasure it contained, to the grown-ups who donned bathrobes and soon found the enthusiasm catching, even at the uncivilized hour of 7 a.m. Then it was time to start final preparations for Christmas dinner to supplement the near heroic deeds of the lady of the house, who had arisen even as the rosy fingers of dawn were tinting the now clear skies to put the turkey in the oven, from which now spread the delicious aroma of roasting bird. Every leaf had been added to the old dining room table, extending its extremity almost into the living room, and several card tables had been set up to help accommodate the uncles, cousins, and friends who would enjoy the meal. And enjoy it they did, from the celery and olives to the turkey and stuffing, cranberry sauce, yams, sauerkraut, mashed potatoes and gravy, peas and hot rolls, to the hot mince pie, mince and coffee for the grown-ups, who reminisced endlessly after the kids were released to play with their new treasures. So passed Christmas Day, and the time of bell snickling drew closer. And it was in that time between Christmas and New Year's Day that an evening was mysteriously designated. The eight-year-old boy never knew how when neighbors were invited to come to the house for the event. In addition to shoring up the floor, other necessary preparations were made in the large hall. Carpets were taken up, chairs and tables were removed, and all chests and secretaries were pushed up against the walls. Cookies were baked and punch prepared in quantity. On the appointed evening after an early supper, the family waited to receive the bell snickers. Soon after darkness had fallen, a rustling was heard outside the windows by the door. Strange vocal sounds, certainly of human origin but scarcely resembling human speech, were also heard. Then an odd tapping came at the door, and the eight-year-old ran to fling it wide open. There in the half-light stood four figures. For heads, these creatures wore paper bags with slits for eyes and nose. For hands, they displayed bulging cotton gloves, for all the world like scarecrow's hands and for feet, 
They wore old boots, old button shoes, or unlaced high top footwear. The remainder of their figures were concealed in bulky jackets and breeches, so that it was impossible to guess whether they were male or female. To cordial greetings from the lady of the house and invitations to enter, the figures replied with grunts and giggles and high-pitched squeals. Then they slowly sidled their way into the great hall to find a place against the wall. I know you, you're Billy Miller, said the eight-year-old to one of the creatures. <laughs> was the only reply. Then the additional groups arrived. They were greeted and invited to enter and responded with the same unintelligible mixture of sounds. Gradually, the figures filled up most of the wall space in the hall. There was mumbling between adjacent figures and now and then a giggle or falsetto laugh, but none would respond in coherent words to any questions or guesses as to their identity. Now, several fiddlers appeared and took their places at seats set out for them at one end of the hall. The pleasant scratching of their bows on the strings as they tuned up provided a musical background for the shuffling and mumbling of the strange creatures filling the hall. Once tuned, the fiddlers lost no time in getting out their work, and here and there a toe began to tap as the rhythmic strains of turkey in the straw issued forth from the strings. The daughter of the family invited the creature next to her to dance, and the creature obliged, at first shuffling and padding around to the music, but gradually revealing a grace and sense of rhythm belying its strange appearance. Additional creature couples slowly joined in until the hall was partially filled with the shuffling and dancing figures. One of the fiddlers called out an invitation to choose partners for a Paul Jones dance, and soon the dancers were organized into a chain, following the figures announced by the call. So it went on, and as the dances progressed, one and then another of the bell snifflers shed the paper bag mask to be revealed as neighbor John and neighbor Mary, to the amused cries of, I knew who you were, or I never would have guessed. In short order, all the bulky disguises were laid aside, and the dancing proceeded in a more normal manner. Some dancers seemed to be indefatigable, while others took a break from the vigorous exercise and joined those refreshing themselves around the punch bowl in the dining room. The music went on and on, dancing never slacking in its exuberance, and sure enough, everything in the house jingled with the stamp of the dancers' flying feet. It was hours after the eight-year-old's normal bedtime before the fiddlers finally fell still, and the last dancers took their leave. The visit of the Bell Snickers was over for another year. Postscript. The time-honored local custom of bell snickling was seriously threatened by the increasing availability of automobiles, radios, and dance halls as the 1920s gave way to the 1930s. As far as the writer knows, the custom had faded from the local area by the early 1940s and certainly did not survive World War II. Its discontinuance in the household described came somewhat earlier, both in response to the heightened concern for the ancient floor joist, as well as the result of the remark overheard by the lady of the house on one occasion. Often late in the evening, the hall door was left open to better cool and ventilate the dancers, and people came and went, often standing for a time at the open door looking in on the proceedings. At our last bell snickling dance, one looker-on was heard to remark, Hump, do they call this a dance hall? We have lots of bigger halls than this up in York. And a very Merry Christmas to you. Oral histories recorded in the 1980s corroborate the bell schnickling or Chris Kringling tradition in Catoctin Furnace. George and Noreen Shook recounted, That's all dead now. We'd start in November and make our costumes, and right after Christmas, we went every night. That was every night. We was around at different houses. They looked for you to come. Now the Halloweeners takes it. They'd better go back to the old ways. They'd be better off. We would start out down at the furnace. We would go to Thermont and around by Kriggerstown and come on around, clean around. Music went from house to house. They would be looking for us. They had the best food rolled the rugs up off the floor, take the furniture out of about three rooms. We sang, and you would get rid of your false face. If they let you in, you had to remove your false face. They'd have the nicest dances in the manor house, twice a year. That was something to look forward to. Boy, you could do see do there. We had too many men for the women, so they tied a ribbon around their arm. They were supposed to be the women, you know. Every place we got gingerbread and our cider, pretty sweet cider, and we'd make root beer. 
That Jim Leatherman did fix that wine and regular Christmas cookies and potato chips, and he fixed cider, too. We used to make it up here on the hill. We put raisins and brown sugar, made a whole barrel, make a whole barrel of apple cider and a barrel of pear cider. Them was the good old days. Beginning in 2011, the Catoctin Furnace Historical Society began a new custom with traditional village Christmas. Research demonstrated that bell schnickling in Catoctin Furnace was more than the activities of mummers and carolers in disguise. Several village residents remember stories told by their parents about the fear and anticipation they felt as children when Belschnickel arrived. Apparently, he visited village homes and questioned the children about their behavior, asked them to sing, dance, or recite for him. His visit was often announced by the sound of his sticks or staff raking across the window panes from the outside. After several minutes passed, To heighten the suspense, the door opened a crack, and presently a handful of nuts rattled across the floor. Finally, with a rain of more nuts, the door opened wider, and in strode the Belschnickel. He generally wore a disheveled fur coat, or a coat turned inside out, and old torn pants. Since he was coming from the mountains, he sometimes wore horns like a deer. His visits were both scary and exhilarating. A visit by Belschnickel has become part of our annual celebration during traditional village Christmas. Please join us next year. From all of us at the Catoctin Furnace Historical Society, have a wonderful Christmas season full of memories of the past and the preparation of memories for the future.